Uh, Carlo was one of the first people that I spoke to when I was starting the Rosalind Franklin Society, and uh, she has broken new ground for women in neuroscience at Harvard. She was the first woman to receive a PhD in neurobiology and the first to chair the neurobiology department. And then she went off to California, to Stanford, and currently directs BioX, an interdisciplinary institute at Stanford, drawing on researchers in biomedical and physical sciences, clinicians, engineers, and computer sciences to investigate big questions in biology. In 2011, she was awarded the prestigious Girard Prize for cancer achievement in neuroscience, for career achievement in neuroscience. This is a terrific statement of somebody of great accomplishment and she has received the recognition for which she she is due so let's give her a warm welcome and she's going to tell us first of all how she got where she is and some of the work that she's doing well first uh Marianne, thank you, and Carla, thank you for your persistence in um, inviting me, and uh, I guess it really shows how the society works, that you, you don't give up, which is really important. <laughs> and uh, the other thing I want to say is, you know, I was just thinking about uh, your comment, Marianne, that we really have to just keep working on the process of nominating women. and. Uh, uh, I think this issue of persistence is extremely important. We cannot stop, and I've heard, you know, so many times uh, on uh, juries that I sit on, you know, where someone will say, "Well, I didn't nominate her this year because I nominated her last year, and she didn't, she didn't get it." And I think what many people don't actually appreciate is that for men and women, the the process of of receiving a major award is uh, is a long term process, and it's not just the major awards; it's even, you know, membership in the academies. Uh, so, I think this idea of persistence is really extremely important, and. Um, uh, and I'm certainly, uh, I'm certainly in that boat of uh, continuing to bring up the names of women. The other thing I was thinking is that often, you know, even to be considered for some of these major awards, there's there's some entry fees to be paid, and some of them actually require that you're already a member of some of the major honorific societies um, in our country or abroad. And so I think, again, maybe we don't really appreciate that. And um, I know that at the National Academy of Sciences, uh, uh, there's a kind of a, a list of very uh, good men and women who are all waiting in the wings, and uh, I think it really helps for those women to be elected to the academies too before they're, you know, then they, they seem to get some kind of, you know, uh, imprimatur, and then they can really be competitive. So I guess now, even though my uh, uh, presentation was working, it, is it working? Are you ready to go? And it is working, good. So let's, let, we can get going. So, um, you know, so I was invited to come and talk a bit about, about BioX. I guess I didn't realize, I, was, I guess you wanted me to talk a little bit about how I got to where I am. But I, I think maybe you will have, I hope you'll have a sense of that from my presentation because I'm very, very excited about this program and I want to tell you about it. And, you know, I, I like to joke sometimes that if I tell you I have to kill you, but in this case I'll make an exception <laughs> and I'll tell you about the X in BioX. So, um, uh, the mission, which you can't see here, but the mission is actually to really uh, understand life's complexities by encouraging collaboration at the intersections of fields. And so this is really an area of, it's not just uh, clinical research or biomedical research, it's really life in general. And, uh, and it's really this idea that some of it will have a spin-off in, in terms of benefiting human health, but some of it will be to simply create new knowledge, which I think is equally important. And uh, as I talk, I will explain a little bit why I'm interested in BioX and actually why I moved back from Stanford. I've had a kind of complicated um, travel and life history starting at Harvard and getting my degree there and then being hired at Stanford to begin my uh, faculty career and then being recruited back to Harvard to become chair of the neurobiology department at Harvard Medical School and then going back to Stanford again to run BioX and, and I'll try to explain a little bit about that. But 
you know, I just thought to give you a visual impression of kind of what attracts me about this program, I just want to show you this, these images, and I'll explain them in a minute, before BioX and after BioX. Um, now this is kind of an interactome, and every square here is a person, it's a, a member of the Stanford faculty. And uh, the lines connecting faculty members uh, are, are quantitatively measured by uh, assessing the number of, uh, I guess you want me to use this, right? Yeah, by, by assessing the number of um, uh, shared PhD students, uh, co-published papers, uh, grants that are co-PI'd and so on. So each line represents a person. And you can see that even before BioX, there were a few intensely collaborative and interactive people at, at Stanford in, in, in the biomedical and life sciences areas. And incidentally, the colors are just selected from three schools. So uh, it's green is uh, the School of Humanities and Sciences. It's actually the biology department. I think uh, blue is, what did I say, mechanical engineering, so School of Engineering. And purple is the medical school. So it just gives you a sense of three different departments. So the other people are just in different departments. And the point I want to make simply is that whatever the BioX did, it intensively increased the collaborations between faculty across the university and, uh, in particular, these interdisciplinary collaborations. Now let me tell you a little bit about that. So, uh, and, and I should say that this program uh, was originally conceived uh, and supported by Stephen Chu, and uh, then so you know in physics, and uh, Jim Spudich in who did get one of the Laskers I think this year actually, um, uh, in the School of Medicine. Channing Robertson in the School of Engineering, and Dick Zair in Chemistry. And, and actually, the, the concept was, wouldn't it be great if we could have a program that, co that encouraged collaborations across disciplines? Uh, and at the time, the president of the university, um, John Hennessy, also said, well, if we're going to do this thing, let's actually follow it. Let's figure, you know, let's see if there are outcomes. And so what I just showed you is part of an outcome analysis that's being conducted now at Stanford from the School of uh, the School of Education. So let me talk a little bit about what is BioX. So the original concept was let X equal these different fields uh, at, and mix them together. And I, I kind of like to joke that uh, and 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 create a home for this program in a beautiful not so new building anymore, but it's about 10 years old, um, that uh, was created to literally put all these different people in together. And in fact, I kind of joke that it's like Noah's Ark, because really, originally, the idea was, well, let's just put everybody in the building two by two, you know, two engineers, two neurosurgeons, two of this, two of that, and let them breed, and let's see what happens. And uh, actually, my job, so I wasn't there at the beginning of BioX. I was invited to come back to Stanford about five years ago to figure out what the heck had happened, not just in the building, but also in the, in the program. How, because it started uh, with a very small group of highly collaborative people. That was actually one of the criteria for going to the building was, you know, okay, let's have these different disciplines and some proof that you actually were working across disciplines and were some, you know, you were somebody who was collaborative. So that was my job. So I want to tell you something about what did actually happen. So there are about 44 faculty in the building now. The building is completely packed. And uh, you know I think more than 600 people, physically, bodies in the building. So BioX is a program. It is not a department. You can't get a BioX degree, even though it's really cute. The undergrads often email me and ask me, how do I major in BioX, which is very cute. Um, right now, we have. Five, almost, you know, almost 600 faculty across the university, um, and 21% uh, of them are women. And that's actually pretty good, although I wish it were better. But it's good because in the sense that uh, we're counting in the faculty here, um, there's a very large representation from the School of Engineering, from uh, you know many people in uh, the hard physical sciences, uh, physics and chemistry, 
uh, and math and statistics and so on. So uh, it's not bad. You know, it'd be great if it were 40%. Um, and it's all over the place across all of the schools, actually, uh, except I think now, I don't think there's anyone who's signed up from the, you know, the School of Music, but um, it is a uh, kind of a web. And imagine that this web is a web that runs across the university horizontally, weaving together different disciplines and trying to break down the silos of individual schools, departments, and disciplines. So that's actually the idea, is to, is to construct something on top of what is already the strength of the university. So we don't make appointments. We encourage people to join. I have some uh, faculty slots that I can use uh, as carrots. In fact, everything I have is a carrot, which I love. Um, it, so I have faculty slots that I can give out uh, to departments, to partner with departments, particularly if a person who's being recruited doesn't quite fit into a specific school or discipline. And that happens now, it's, it's, it seems to be happening more as these interdisciplinary themes become more popular in terms of hiring. So we just hired a young man, Surya Ganguly, who is trained in um, physics and is a, now a theoretical neuroscientist. And many different departments were very interested in him. And everyone said, well, we really don't have a slot for this guy at this point, um, but he's terrific. Uh, but you know, we're not sure how he would fit into teaching. And so we partnered, and he came. And so it's that kind of idea. So we build on the strengths of the individual departments. We rely on the faculty of those departments for quality control. And then we encourage collaborations. Now, you could ask, why, are, why do you need such a program? And I mean, I don't have to tell you guys, but I mean, the idea here is that basically the last 50 years, what we saw in, uh, in life sciences and biomedical research was a tremendous reductionist approach. Fabulous, with you know, the sequencing of, uh, of uh, the genome and with the discovery of DNA and so on and so forth. And we've really reduced life to its building blocks. But as all of you know, basically the problem now of our century is to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And I would like to argue that you can't do this only with, let's say, one method, namely, let's say, genetics. Genetics is extremely powerful, but it's more complicated than that. And so I think we really need every tool in the toolkit. And this, you know, it really is too bright here. But I'm just going to say, I really know this personally. So now I want to just explain a little bit what attracted me to BioX and a little bit about my own approach and a little bit about science, like two milliseconds worth of my own science. But let me just say, I mean, as a neuroscientist, the one thing you cannot really do is reduce the brain to a molecule or a cell. I mean, even a cell, it's not in a circuit, duh, therefore it's not really um, part of, you know, it's not, you're not studying it in a realistic way, and yet, of course, that's what we've done, is we have reduced life and the brain to cells and, and single molecules. In my own lab, we're really interested in how early experience and brain function ultimately tune up brain circuits, leading eventually, of course, to nor the, the functioning of the adult brain and perception and action. So we really want to understand what's happening in early critical periods of development in, in children's brains, and even earlier in the fetal brain, that ultimately lead to the um, emergence of the adult pattern of connectivity. And so in trying to understand this, of course, we've also become extremely reductionist. And we've even found genes that if you knock them out of mice, the mice are actually smarter than wild-type mice. And I'm happy to talk about what this might mean later. But let me just say, the other thing that we found is that in development, the adult pattern of connectivity between eye and brain is not the same as the immature pattern. In fact, the immature pattern is a mixed pattern where the inputs from the two eyes converge onto the same cells in the target structure. But in the adult, the pattern is segregated so that the input from the right eye goes to some cells and the input from the left eye goes to other cells. And in to trying to understand this, we were forced to study everything in vivo. And 
not only that, but we were uh, discovered many years ago that um, the eye early in development sends signals to the brain, and those signals are like running test patterns on connections in the brain, and then keeping the right ones and eliminating the wrong ones through an activity-dependent, neural activity, activity-dependent process of tuning, of circuit tuning. And to try to understand this, it actually required that we study not one neuron at a time, but hundreds of neurons at a time. And in, in the days when we started these experiments, I actually was at Stanford, and I collaborated with quite a number of people there, including Dennis Baylor uh, and uh, uh, a young man, Marcus Meister, who had come from Caltech. And they had invented a really cool method using, in fact, engineering methods to, um, to imprint very small electrodes that allowed you to record from hundreds of nerve cells at one time. And we used this kind of technique, just want to show you a little movie, uh, and also a calcium imaging technique to record literally from hundreds and hundreds of nerve cells. That's what you're looking at here is a movie of the pattern of neural activity in the eye that we know is being sent to the brain. And each one of these little black dots is an individual nerve cell. And the bottom line here is you're watching a movie where when things become black, hundreds of nerve cells are placing phone calls from the eye to the brain, and they're doing this testing of connections. And it's through this process the, that the adult pattern emerges. And so, you know, years ago, I realized that we couldn't solve these problems on our own. And already at that time, we were collaborating with physicists and actually chemists and uh, uh, engineers who, who built amazing microscopes, confocal microscopes that would let you see this sort of thing and so on. And I realized that um, this approach of uh, sort of open collaboration, generosity, uh, was really important to the advancement of any, any research that, that is going on at the systems level or, or above. Um, and so I, I guess I felt that since my own career so benefited from this, I really wanted to be able to share this kind of experience with others. And I've spent a lot of time during my life now uh, trying to make resources available. So when I heard about BioX, I was extremely excited to uh, try to see if I could participate. OK, so what I realized, part of my job, as I said, when I came back to Stanford from Harvard is, was to figure out what BioX was, because it wasn't, it isn't just Noah's Ark. And so the question was, what is it, and can I uh, actually build a, a case for BioX so that the program would continue and go forward? And incidentally, part of my job is to raise money for the program. So this is, if you have carrots to give out, they don't just come from the sky. So. Uh, as I said, the mission is really to uh, encourage interdisciplinary collaboration, and we really need to do that to solve these complex systems problems. Um, and so to do that now over the last few years, there were two fundamental programs that BioX runs, and two more that we've actually, actually three more that we've, that we've added. And I want to just explain them for a minute, but let me just say one other thing first. What I like about this program is that it's completely open competition. So we make no assumptions about who is in and who is out. And I think this is, you know, if, if you think about diversity and about how to really encourage women and minorities and everyone to participate in an equal way, this to me is the right way to do it. So you don't say, well, we're only, we're going to limit this program to a subset of people. So the entire university, anyone on the faculty or who's a student is eligible, but to join the program you have to be a member of the faculty at Stanford. It can be anywhere. And all you have to do is write me an email and say you want to join and we just make sure you're actually on the faculty. And then you're eligible to compete for funding. And the programs include uh, what we, it's kind of a high risk seed grant program called the Interdisciplinary Initiatives Program, uh, a set of graduate fellowships, and uh, some uh, undergraduate research experience, and then some innovation labs. Let me just say a word about the innovation labs. So these are like cores, but they're not cores. These are, uh, labs that try to capitalize on inventions and technologies that have been uh, 
recently made by Stanford faculty that suddenly everybody wants to use. And I'll give you one example later. And, and yet, you know, their labs are overrun by people both within Stanford and also maybe across the world who want to use these before you can buy something off the shelf, which is probably 10 years later. So if we can find the resources, we've created these labs, which are essentially additional space for the inventor to teach the new thing to faculty and students. And if we can, we also usually hire a senior scientist to run the lab and get things going by buying some fundamental pieces of equipment. And this has proved extremely successful. So for example, there's a microfluidics foundry now that BioX has created that was really invented by Steve Quake uh, who, when he came to, to BioX to Stanford and is available for anyone throughout the world now to come and use to, to make their own microfluidic device. There's an optogenetics innovation lab, again, which uh, found the uh, discoverer Carl Dyseroff, uh, everybody wanted to learn how to use this method. And again, we have a lab that teaches the technique and allows people to troubleshoot their experiments, both faculty and students from anywhere in the world, actually. That's, those would be examples. Let me talk about the seed funding for a minute because I think this really makes the case for BioX. And incidentally, you know, Carla, tell me when, um, give me about like a half, half an hour heads up. I think, well, I you know. Yes, and I'm the director of BioX. Oh. And today we have a really amazing thing happening here at the Clark Center. It's a poster session and a scientific session where people are presenting the work that's been funded by BioX seed grants. And these seed grants are really intended for um, innovative and um, disruptive experiments that are maybe a bit high risk, maybe they don't all work. But if they do work, often they lead to just um, tremendous breakthroughs and other discoveries and additional funding. My name is Sarah Moore, and I'm a graduate student in the bioengineering program. Just finished my fifth year. I came to Stanford in bioengineering because it was at the intersection of medicine and engineering. The medical schools right next door, the engineering schools right next door, and our department is between the two. And that really excited me because it meant to research that was very applied and directed towards healthy patients. I came to Stanford to uh, do something that was interdisciplinary, in particular, I was interested in the connection between biology and physics. And uh, the biology program has given me an opportunity to really integrate uh, the aspects of uh, experimental biology and computational physics. What we've done is stem cells and we have started a life sensitive protein in stem cell and then we made these cells into heart cells and by just using light instead of traditional electrical stimulation we can paste the uh, cell we can paste the, the heart cell so that that's great we can we can go on there we go. So actually, that's the optogenetics. I just thought it's fun to see this. I mean, this. So what? What? What did you see? I mean, you saw a, a, sympo uh, a poster session following a symposium uh, that uh, uh, presented a lot of the work that people have been funded for with these seed grants. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute because I think it's an important part of the program itself. So this seed funding program is for uh, actually really high risk potentially high reward science. And we're happy if one thing works, if just one of the grants that we fund. I mean, you'll see that it's, it's actually been an extremely successful program. But the idea is that if, uh, if we think that it's something that already would be eminently fundable by uh, formally by NIH or NSF or something, we, we will not fund it. So this is really, we're looking for failure, we're hoping for success, basically. Um, uh, we can fund about 20 or so proposals each round. And they are, they're funded for two years, 75K a year. So that's about $3 million every other year that I have to find. At this point, uh, Hennessy's very happy that the program's working, so he will backstop the program. So we run it every other year. Um, we can fund about 20%, which is a pretty good success rate these days. And so faculty are very engaged in this competition, open competition. And to date, we funded about 140 proposals uh, over 600 applications, 
Uh, and the, the program's been going on now, actually just had its sixth competition, so it's just beginning its, its 12th year. And just to give you a sense of the rounds, so actually we just had the sixth round, I didn't have time to update, but it, it's generated a tremendous amount of activity and interest across the university. So for example, we let's say in round five, same thing in round six, about 120 letters of intent that involved about 220 faculty in 51 departments in five schools across the university. And then we can only accept, we, can, we made 24 awards, and this includes a lot of faculty. And when we actually, oh, and I, I'm sorry about the red. I didn't realize it's going to be so bright here. But so I did look, again, at the number of women who are participating. And I, I didn't just do this for today. I've actually been very uh, interested in how, in whether this, team-based process uh, recruits women scientists. And it's interesting, um, about 41% of the, all the teams have wi a woman in the team. So remember, these are interdisciplinary, and there are a number of faculty involved in the teams. Um, of the PIs, 19% of the successful PIs are women. So again, it's like that same number. It's about 20%. Again, I wish it were better, but it's pretty good. Uh, and then my point is that we don't just give these awards, but they're sh the results are shared. And oftentimes, actually, it's fun. People will get up there and they'll say, well, actually, you know, this didn't work, but we used the money to do this, and this did work. And um, we really require that everybody get up there and say what they did and what happened. And it's so we have two symposia and poster sessions a year. So this is one of the two that you saw, and often, over 100 people will come. There were over 100 posters at this one. And people actually use it to troll for ideas and further collaborations. So it's actually really become a way of building upon the original interdisciplinary nature and interactive nature of the program in the first place. Now, there are a number of successes that, and stories that I can tell, and I just don't have time, but I'm really happy to tell them. And quite a number of them are actually on the BioX website. If you actually click on Seed Grants or IIP Grants, if you go to Grants, you can read about many of these and what, what we funded. Uh, but what's interesting is, uh, for example, uh, a program, a, a group, a team that invented a microendoscope, uh, very, very minute microscope that you can insert like a little needle into muscles and gives you incredible resolution in, in living muscle. We funded it to start with. There are now more than six patents uh, filed. And uh, graduate students have been trained, and there's a, a lot of uh, grant money that's been received, and a translational award that allows this group actually to go ahead and try to make a commercial product. And they're actually working on that now. And I think actually HHMI is helping in, in, in making these microendoscopes more uh, available, in fact. Um, another one is this uh, new optogenetics technique, which allows you to express a light-sensitive protein like rhodopsin in any cell you want, shine light on the cell, and couple that to some kind of intracellular signaling cascade or an ion channel, and turn cells on and off. Really cool. And that also now has led, actually there's a, a company, several companies on this. Uh, people are even uh, gearing up for the first uh, gene therapy trials, trying to replace in people who are, are blind, uh, replace this protein in the eye, and so on. Now, we've been asking our awardees how they're doing and whether they considered if the money that we gave them led to further successes in terms of funding. And the answer is an amazing yes. So this is self-reporting. But uh, for, for the first 15 million, which so we've, I'm giving you now the results of five rounds times three million each, when we ask our grantees how are they doing on the outside world, they tell us that they've received formally over $170 million back, they become extremely competitive. Uh, and this is from uh, fe mostly federal sources now, because uh, a number of them have received really large, actually, collaborative grants. Um, and so this is a, a good argument for continuing this program. It's made the faculty uh, really given them the first results that they would need to actually become competitive and go on for follow-up follow funding. 
in addition, of course, we've, we've tr trained many, many graduate students and postdocs and MD-PhD students, and uh, a number of patents have been filed. And there are about four startup companies now that have come out of this program. We'll see what happens to them. So I'm going to just actually wrap up now. I want to tell you one or two more things. I want to talk a little bit about these graduate fellowships and what they are. So again, we don't have a PhD program or an MD-PhD program. This is a program that allows for students who are admitted through a quality control mechanism into other programs at Stanford to do a interdisciplinary PhD that's supervised by more than one advisor across the field. And it turns out, I mean, sometimes it's not so simple because the training grants support uh, training within a field. And some of these students are not able to easily cross borders. So again, we don't have a lot of resources, but we can give 10 of these or so a year. We get about 100 applications, so we wish we had more money. This, in the last few years, we've done better. We've given about 15 a year. Um, and uh, and uh, this program, uh, as I said here, has supported about 128 students since uh, 2004, which is when it started. And actually, it's been you know good. 37% uh, of them are women, which is good uh, because uh, I mean it would you know the the medical school class, so the MD class is about 50% women, but the School of Engineering class is about 10%, 12%, you know, 15% women. So on average, this is actually very good, and it's again open competition, competitive. Uh, and the students are already there. And for example, uh, Adam. Uh, uh, who was one of these students, actually ended up with his work to, he founded a small startup company. I don't know how it's doing right now. He went to do a postdoc, and he's been hired back at Stanford. He just started as an assistant professor. And you can't see, but Viviana Gravinaru here, uh, who was an MD, I mean a PhD student, just started a job as an assistant professor at Caltech, for instance. So it's very early on, but they seem to be doing extremely well, and they're highly employable. So as I said, one of the uh, things that I thought was kind of heartwarming is a student writing to me, an undergrad, saying, well, how do I major in BioX? And I realized that um, we, we really should have a program that exposed the undergraduate students to um, <clears throat> this way of, uh, of collaborative interdisciplinary research. And so again, um, I went out and tries and have uh, raised funds and through a lot of philanthropy actually um, we now have a summer program for uh, undergrads and uh, it's uh, we can fund about 50 undergrads every summer 10 week program and we make sure that they aren't just in a lab pipetting so this is what can happen actually some some kids are really happy to do that but we want them to get a sense of what the program is like so there's a compulsory they love coming lunch every week at seminars and the faculty are asked to give uh, you know a 15-minute presentation and what happens is amazing we we thought the faculty would send their postdocs. We said, fine, send your postdocs. They all come. Every faculty member who has a student in the lab shows up, gives a 15-minute talk. And if you sit there and listen to these talks, you get, over the course of the summer, 40 talks, the most amazing perspective of different areas of research that are going on at Stanford. And it actually gives that um, flavor of interdisciplinary research and of course we encourage the students to network now these are not students who are all majoring you know in science actually in fact we hope many of them uh, are not majoring in science but want that summer experience so they have a sense of what it's actually like to be in a real lab and that has been uh, really fun to run so just to sum up um, as I said, there's this web of interconnected faculty across the university. It's an open <coughs> web. Uh, and it seems that just by having this program in place, um, even the uh, faculty teams that don't win BioX seed funding report that they're, they, they're just by being forced into the competition, selecting to compete, and creating their teams, and working together, they also claim that they have benefited. So in other words, the process has gone beyond just the people who have gotten the funding, which is interesting. Um, and 
Uh, one thing that our colleagues Woody Powell and uh, Dan McFarland have asked in, in the School of Ed is whether, is this a new way for research universities to operate? In other words, building this sort of horizontal interconnectedness on top of the vertical structure of departments and schools. Now, what are the ingredients for success? Um, as I said, I think uh, you have to have a faculty that has a mindset that it's good to collaborate and to be open and generous. And um, I think there are many universities where this is true, um, and I'm happy to be at one of them. Um, so this entrepreneurial spirit is certainly in you know, the Bay Area and Silicon Valley. That helps. Um, it's not just a bottom-up program. Really, at the top, the deans have to be willing to support the program uh, as well. And quite interesting to me and very lovely is that the deans of the School of Engineering, the School of Medicine, and Humanities and Sciences uh, are really supportive and uh, are engaged in this process. And Stanford actually has a process for these interdisciplinary institutes, and that's also helpful to have that kind of structure. But it doesn't work without great departments and schools to get a good faculty in place. And then, as I said, before I raise money, because you don't take away money from departments to build this program, you sort of create additional opportunities. And honestly, sometimes I wonder, I don't think some deans understand that, and uh, anyhow, it's a huge mistake to take away to do something